Every time we make this one recommendation in our videos, it always causes some controversy and upset. I remember reading a research study 10 years or so ago that showed that passive stretching, like you talked about, actually weakens the muscles for a prolonged period or hours after. But a video showcasing a supposed professional encouraging beginners to do the exact opposite of what the research shows to be the safest and most beneficial is irresponsible to the highest regard. Please stop making videos without a disclaimer stating that you have no education or expertise to guide anyone in physical activity. That one got me right in the feels. But I'm ready to talk about it. I do understand where these comments are coming from because in the fitness community, there is a lot of discourse between static stretching being really bad for performance and static stretching being a really good thing to include for your performance. So where is this coming from? Here's a quote from a New York Times article on stretching in sports. Research now believes that some of the more entrenched elements of many athletes' warm-ups are not only a waste of time, but actually bad for you. I seriously don't want to give you bad advice when it comes to training because I care about your enjoyment of the sport and also progressing people's performance. So let's look into this properly. By the end of this video, you should have the full picture. But to start, we need to go back approximately 24 years to see where some of this research started to create a discourse and suggest that static stretching would be bad for performance. This one research paper showed that static stretching could reduce your ability to produce force by a whole 25%. That's a huge amount of loss of force. And because this was so concerning, it kicked off a number of research papers. If you look into the static stretching reduce force, you'll actually see a lot of research papers which go on to support this hypothesis, but generally with a bit less than 25%. So why was the force so massively decreased in this paper? If we dive into the methodology of the study a little bit, Firstly, we'll see that all of the stretches were performed at a maximum intensity. So basically the point before, the participants would say they were in pain. The stretching intervention also lasted for 33 minutes. And actually the rest time between stretches was only ever five seconds. So they spent a whole 30 minutes in time under tension at this intensity. So it's a pretty torturous level of stretching, but it's still important to understand that this does have an effect. So we need to go a little bit deeper into it. Let's look at a little bit more research. In climbing, it's not just about applying force isometrically, we obviously need to move dynamically. So if we look at this paper, which research power, we can also see that static stretching reduced our ability to generate power. What they did in this paper was four different quad stretches, each repeated four times for 30 seconds. Overall, the stretching intervention lasted for approximately 16 minutes, so a little bit more reasonable than the previous paper. But we're still looking at about a 3% reduction in force or maximum power output. The conclusion is that static stretching will reduce our ability to produce force or power, which is a concern that will affect our ability to climb, especially on powerful boulders. This is where a really big issue gets in the way. As climbers, we are not power lifters, we are not sprinters. Climbing is a different sport entirely. It requires a large amount of flexibility and precision, especially with our lower body. Certain moves won't require maximum force production, but might still feel impossible if you don't have the level of flexibility required to execute a move. In this sense, it seems a little bit more applicable to compare it to something like gymnastics or dance. This is why I would generally still recommend that flexibility is included in your warm-up so that you can improve this range of motion before you get on the wall. And it's also probably why we see flexibility ingrained in the warm-up habits of other sports as well, despite this research suggesting that it might be harmful. What about dynamic stretching? This isn't as associated with a loss of force like static stretching is, so problem solved, right? Not quite because with dynamic stretching, it's not always as effective at improving range of motion as static stretching is. And that's particularly true for some specific climbing positions, like the frog position, where you need to open up your hips as wide as possible to get your hips and weight close to the wall. Before we explore why and the solution to this problem, I'm gonna take a quick moment to talk about the sponsor of this video. 
I'm a passionate climber and I am also very passionate about flexibility training if you hadn't guessed it already. Because of this, I have a bit of an obsession when it comes to climbing trousers. Forget that Rungni is sponsoring this video, I genuinely feel good climbing trousers will affect how mobile you are when you climb and your ability to train flexibility. I feel and move better in good climbing trousers. There is nothing worse than having the flexibility but then feeling like you're restricted by the trousers you're wearing and for this reason I haven't actually worn a pair of jeans in about five years. So when Rungni said they wanted to send me some climbing trousers to test out I was actually really excited. But the first thing I did was went straight to the website and I searched what material they're made out of. Luckily all of the trousers they're going to send me had a stretch fabric built into them. Essentially you want to look out for something that says four-way stretch or if it has a high elastin content to it. Something like 13% is the highest I've generally seen in climbing trousers and these always feel like you're not really wearing anything which is ideal for climbing trousers. To summarize I would get the anchor pants if I wanted a warm pair for outdoor climbing but the harness pants are my go-to for hard training sessions. The high baller pants look and feel good and I wear these most days even when I'm not climbing. They're ideal for bouldering or just going to the pub. You can get 15% off all apparel and chalk at Rungni when you use code Lattice at the checkout. You will find a link in the description below. Back to the video and why dynamic stretching just doesn't cut it. Active dynamic stretching relies a lot on the strength of the shortening muscles, so like the hip flexors which would be lifting the leg to stretch the hamstrings. And this is just not going to be as effective at maximizing range of motion as something like a stretch which is using gravity or assistance to pull you deeper into the stretch. Your hip flexors are never going to win a battle against your hamstrings. The balance just isn't there. Yes, you can use more and more momentum to make the dynamic stretch deeper and increase more range of motion. But to a certain extent, you might be leaning into ballistic stretching, which has its own issues, or it becomes quite an uncontrolled stretch. The second reason I don't think dynamic stretches are the only way to go is that they're not super beginner friendly. I actually think things like leg swings, dynamic stretches are better for people that are already flexible. This is why you see dancers doing it a lot. They move very elegantly. But someone that has really tight hamstrings, if you watch them trying to do a leg swing to warm up, it doesn't ever look that good and often it's not really getting a great stretch into the hamstrings for them. Don't get me wrong, I think dynamic stretching is a really important and a great addition to a warm up. I just don't think it's good enough alone if you need to improve range of motion for your sport. My personal recommendation is to layer in both of these into your warm up using static stretching to reach areas which are harder to attain with dynamic stretching alone. Let's look at another sport's approach to flexibility in a warm up. Tom Merrick kindly said we could use this clip from his video of him going through a full warm up and training routine with a world champion gymnast. It's interesting to see an elite level gymnast using static stretching in a warm up for a sport which we would consider to be very powerful and very explosive. The more I looked into other sports like this, the more I'd commonly see this theme that static stretching was included more often for sports which required a really big range of motion for their efficient movement. An area I didn't really manage to get much from was dance and I actually think this is a really interesting area because they require so much precision, although for aesthetic reasons, I think we can learn a lot from this kind of sport. So if you're a dancer and you've got any knowledge about how you generally warm up, let us know in the comments below. But we're trying to be thorough here with our research and remember that New York Times journalist said that these stretching regimens are entrenched despite what some of the research might say it's time to do some more reading into the research. The research at the beginning of this video had some major flaws in it, which is why I think that static stretching is bad, it is one of the biggest myths we have in climbing. The issue in the methodology of some of these research papers which show that big reduction in force is they often follow a very extreme amount of stretching with a very short window of time between, followed by a maximum contraction or a maximum force output, which in practicality, we are never really doing in our sporting practice. When we start to look at the research which places static stretching into the sporting context, we start to see a different picture. So what happens when one, the static stretching duration is more like what we would do in a warm up, and two, it is followed by a sport specific practice. This research paper took 13 netball players and performed two different interventions. In one intervention, the netball players performed a 15 minutes of static stretching. And in the other intervention, in that warm up, the static stretching was replaced with dynamic warm up. They then performed a counter movement jump test and a 20 meter sprint. In the intervention which did the static stretching, they did see a reduction in performance in both of these tests. 
However, they didn't stop there because this was performed immediately after the warm up. What they then did is they continued to perform a high intensity skill based warm up. So essentially, they just started to practice their sport before they would have gone into a competitive environment or performance setting. They then re performed the counter movement jump and the 20 meter sprint, and any loss of power or performance in these tests was restored after just doing this skill based warm up. If you go back and watch our video, the one with the scathing criticism in it, you'll notice that actually I recommend after doing your warm-up or the off the wall based stuff you go to continue your warm-up on the wall with skill practice and try and ramp up the intensity slowly before you would go into a performance based setting personally i think this is a very rational recommendation and something that most people will already be doing but be encouraged that the research suggests that any static stretching you've done any loss of force that you might have had from that should be restored by the time you actually try anything hard these findings are in line with other research I've seen, which suggests that after about 10 minutes, the loss of force you might get from static stretching is restored, even if you're just not warming up. Essentially, it just takes a little bit of time to get your power back. So static stretching is not bad for performance, but could it be harmful? A more recent research paper called Acute Effects of Static Stretching on Muscle Strength and Power has some interesting findings and implications that we should look at. Firstly, short duration stretching, that is less than 60 seconds, typically will impair muscle force by about one to 2%. So this is trivial for most people, but still something you might want to consider. So if one to 2% of your top end is gonna impair performance, more than static stretching might improve your performance, then you might want to avoid it in your training. Also remember that this one to 2% is gonna be specific to the muscle stretched. So if you're stretching your hamstrings, it's not gonna affect one to 2% in your finger flexors, for example. They also say that recent evidence suggests that including static stretching in a warm up might even reduce the risk of musculoskeletal injuries. I don't think the research here is conclusive, but it kind of makes sense to me. And I think it's advice we should heed. For example, I wouldn't wanna pull on a heel hook that's really stretched out if I hadn't first warmed up that range of motion in my warm up. So what are our personal recommendations when it comes to static stretching in your warm up? Number one is if you need to improve your flexibility, doing static stretching in your warm up is a great place for it. It will improve your movement efficiency and therefore your performance. The range of motion increase will be maintained long after your strength and power has returned, which is typically around 10 to 15 minutes. Number two is keep your stretches less than 60 seconds. The research suggests that these short duration stretches will mean any loss of force is generally quite trivial to the average person that is training for the long term. However, some people might benefit from longer duration stretches if one, they continue to see that range of motion improve and two, flexibility is something that is really high priority for their climbing. Number three is do avoid long duration stretches in any muscles that require a high level of rate of force development. And this might be the fingers or things like the shoulder. Number four is to put your static stretching at the beginning of the warm up, perhaps after a little bit of a pulse raiser, but generally if it's at the beginning of your warm up, you're gonna leave plenty of time for that force to recover. Number five is to continue your warm up on the wall with some high intensity skill based work. Again, this just allows time for your force to recover, but generally it's a good recommendation for climbers to put a bit of skill practice at the beginning of their session. Of course, the last recommendation is to get yourself some stretchy trousers. Head to the link in the description below to get yourself 15% off all Rungley clothing and chalk.